Welcome to Executives at the Edge, a podcast brought to you by MEF. I'm your host, Pascal Menezes. Join me as we explore thought-provoking perspectives from the leaders and change makers who are propelling enterprise digital transformation forward. Well, I'm really excited to have Greg Quiggle, SVP Product Management from Kratos. I think in this episode, you're gonna find something really interesting, how satellite is playing a very significant role in all our lives, especially businesses, but also consumers. Satellite will cover, it covers the world and provides connectivity now to everywhere, every point on the planet. So with this, I wanna, I wanna really welcome Greg to Executives at the Edge. Greg, welcome, and please talk more about yourself and Kratos as a company. Thanks for having me on the show, uh, Pascal, and uh, looking forward to, uh, to having a great conversation with you today. Um, I'm going to actually start with uh, with a little bit about Kratos. I'd be willing to bet most of your listeners haven't heard of Kratos before, and it's because we're really not a traditional player um, within uh, the terrestrial carriers around the world. We actually provide ground systems um, for the satellite operators, uh, companies like Intelsat and SES and, and, and Marsat. Um, historically, our, our interest with them has been to allow them to provide the ground infrastructure needed um, for them to sell uh, services based on the satellites that they um, they operate on orbit. Well, thank you, Greg. A little bit of background on yourself, too? Yeah, sh- sure. So I, I've been at Kratos for about five years. I'm a senior vice president of product management. Um, but uh, my interest in, in knowledge about MEF actually uh, goes well before that. So before joining Kratos, um, I spent about uh, 10 years at a company called uh, iDirect, which provides uh, broadband systems over satellite. And then before that, I worked at a few uh, um, manufacturers that actually provided equipment um, to uh, trust real uh, operators around the world. So Greg, you know, help our listeners understand what's going on. You know, Digital transformation is massive. It's changing everything from all the workflows being digitized, but also new use cases like IoT, AI, ML, AR, VR start to emerge with the metaverse and so on. But how will digital transformation take advantage of satellite technology? Can you help our, our listeners with this? Yeah, sure. And, and I think that to best describe that, we first need to talk about one of the primary drivers um, for it. And it really comes down to the amount of available bandwidth um, that we see now lighting up in our industry. Um, historically, um, the satellite industry was very bandwidth constrained. Um, so that limited um, access for a very large number of users, um, either based on the bandwidth required for a given application or, frankly, the price um, per megahertz. Um, nowadays, really over the last five years, we've seen an explosion in bandwidth and it's come in the form of uh, new new satellite orbits. Historically, communications was done primarily over um, geostationary orbit satellites, geos. Um, you know, n- nowadays we see uh, communication services provided b- via Middle Earth orbit or MEO and Low Earth orbit or, um, or LEO uh, satellites. Um, in doing that, we've seen a huge explosion in bandwidth, which makes a satellite much more usable um, and accessible by the mainstream communications user. Um, we've also seen a pretty dramatic uh, drop in the cost um, of satellite bandwidth. And just to put it in perspective, I mentioned earlier, I, I started in the industry, um, in the space industry, um, with a, a company called iDirect. Um, about 2010 is when I started. And back then, Satellite bandwidth cost about $5,000 per megahertz per month. Um, nowadays, here at the end of 2023, it's pretty common to see satellite bandwidth uh, more around $500 per megahertz per month. So a substantial reduction in terms of cost. Um, what that's doing is it's driving the need for our industry to scale much faster than it ever has before. Way more bandwidth, much lower cost ultimately uh, provides you know, the opportunity to provide services to a much broader base of users. Um, and we view digital transformation as a, as a key way to do that. Um, you know, if, if you look at what a typical satellite ground system looks like today, it's, it's really not that much different than what you would have seen if you would have walked into a central office um, in, in uh, the terrestrial communications industry back in the late 90s. It's racks and racks and racks of hardware. 
oftentimes purpose-built, uh, many times proprietary. Um, and what digital transformation does for us is it allows us to move off of um, that stove-piped hardware infrastructure um, and run on more um, common mainstream infrastructure, um, things like private cloud and public cloud. Um, it also allows us to move from um, historically uh, manual uh, workflows um, to something that's much more automated using uh, mainstream org orchestration workflows. Um, so, so ultimately, the, the the real value to our industry, why we care about digital transformation, it's it's for us to get from a service deployment that historically might have taken weeks to months, um, now to minutes, largely through common infrastructure um, that's digitally transformed in mainstream orchestration. Wow, that, that's incredible minutes. Um, you know, there are business opportunities. I'm really trying to understand what are these business opportunities for satellite technologies, for service providers. You know, you talk about Starlink, what they did with Ukraine. That's just an example of a use case. Like, what are the typical use cases and business opportunities? So I think you could actually break it down into into three, um, Pascal. The, the first um, uh, we would consider uh, just enterprise network extension. Um, you know, now, nowadays that comes in the form of a carrier Ethernet. Um, I think as we look forward to some of the other things being driven by uh, by the the MEF community, um, it moves on to things like SD WAN, um, you know, and IP services. But I I would tell you at its most basic level, um, it's providing uh, um, standards based carrier Ethernet connectivity. I mean, what that really does um, for um, the carriers around the world um, is it allows this allows them to offer their standard service portfolio. Um, you know, to customers um, over satellite. Um, and it might seem pretty fundamental, but um, I, I would tell you for years, our industry struggled with that um, because the bandwidth was so constrained. Um, typically what um, equipment providers would do in the space industry is they would, um, they would compress, um, you know, uh, simple things like ethernet um, headers um, and IP headers in order to optimize uh, the flow of information over the, over the satellite itself. Um, in doing that, um, it increased the bits per hertz in a very constrained environment. But um, on the downside is it really broke satellite um, industry away from all of the mainstream standards that the broader communications industry was following. So although it seems pretty fundamental, um, at a basic level, what it allows us to do finally is offer um, a standard portfolio of enterprise services over satellite, just like you can any other um, access network topology, whether that be fiber wireless or or others. Um, so, so beyond um, enterprise network extension, I would tell you uh, similar opportunities for us to extend cloud connectivity. Um, and then also uh, I, I would tell you it allows us to really much better serve um, the movement around 5G um, and virtualization of the RAN. Well, wow, so what you're saying is basically the typical use case for connectivity that you get from wired and wireless is now extended to satellite. Yeah, that's right. So, so to the satellite operator um, that that's listening uh, today, um, it really gives them the opportunity to operate in a much broader uh, network as a service ecosystem. Uh, historically, um, that's that's been a really tough play because satellite has felt like the last option, um, and typically was hard and expensive. Um, you know, to more of the mainstream carrier that's listening today. I would tell you it finally gives you an opportunity to leverage satellite for what it's best at and its reach. Um, it might be connectivity to an airplane. Um, it might be connectivity to a vessel um, it might, at, at sea. Um, it might be connectivity to, uh, to a small community right in a third world country. Um, historically, um, it, it almost wasn't worth it um, because it, it forced you to break away from all of your typical uh, service portfolio um, automation um, and SLA management techniques in order to use satellites. So it was really a last choice. Um, not nowadays with digital transformation and largely through uh, you know what our uh, um, unified support for MEF, um, it makes satellite just look like another access network. So if, if you uh, if you sell a service to a large enterprise client um, and some of their sites are hard to reach, you can now actually reach the sites in minutes through a satellite bandwidth uh, at, at a format that's way more uh, cost effective um, and one that allows you to get, you know, really the mainstream kind of service connectivity and SLA visibility you enjoy with other access technologies. Yeah, so very interesting. You know, at MEF, we've been doing this 
you know, Sonata APIs, which are really into provide automation. So buyers and sellers across the ecosystem can buy and sell all kinds of, you know, services, connectivity being one of them. So how would the, now these satellite operators work with these service provider telecom networks to just naturally integrate this satellite technology as a connectivity option in the buy-sell model of this automation. So, you know, I'm talking automation. So how do you see this working and how how does MEF and the standards play in this reality? So so in this case, uh, um, Pascal, you'd see a, a satellite operator um, like an Intelsat or an SES, for example. Um, they would participate with those same Sonata-based APIs um, to allow you to provision a common set, an understood set of services um, across operators, now including satellite bandwidth. Um, so, so it really comes down to those satellite operators really investing in those same APIs that you see with your broader carrier ecosystem. Um, what it means to Kratos is, is we typically sit below um, those APIs and we'll do things like LSO Presto. Um, um, so that, um, you know, as the requests for new services come in, um, the, the way that they're deployed um, on common digital infrastructure um, and lit up over the satellite um, becomes uh, much more seamless. Um, when, when we do that now, the carrier, the, the AT&T, for example, um, can um, get much quicker provisioning of a service. Um, can make sure that the service um, really follows the same principles as their portfolio with other access technologies. And I would tell you almost every bit as important is they also get uh, very similar um, you know, visibility into the end-to-end -end network for SLA management. So like a use case would be enterprise comes to, let's say, a service bar like AT&T, says, hey, I've got all these sites globally, uh, light them up for Ethernet, and we'll talk about internet in a second. Yep. Um, and some of them are not reachable. And so now with the satellite technology, they can go out to the satellite operators and say, hey, these geolocations, um, give me a price. Can you reach them? What's the price? And all that. And um, that's relayed back to the customer. And if they accept it, they can basically, what you're saying is provision that and turn up that service very rapidly um, at those locations. Obviously, equipment has to be sent out and everything. So it's not going to happen in seconds. But certainly not months or sometimes years, but more like you know weeks. But potentially, is that is do I have you, that right? You nailed it. So I I would tell you, you know, the benefit of satellite, the unique benefit is it literally reaches anywhere on the Earth's surface. So uh, so you're right. That enterprise goes to a carrier like an AT and T and says, "Hey, I'd like to light up these hundred sites." Um, historically, what happened is you know the 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 carrier could get to maybe ninety of them, and the last ten were really hard. Um, and, uh, I, I would tell you personally, the carrier would say, ah, oh, I have to use satellite. Um, and when they did that, they would have to literally manage those 10 circuits in a way, very independent of the way they managed uh, the other 90. Um, and over time it would get to a point where it almost wasn't worth it. It just didn't scale. Um, so, so you're exactly right now. Um, what you can do is just based on the geo coordinates of a site. Um, what that does is it dictates the satellite and the beam. Um, that you would use to access a given site, and you could automate um, the delivery of, of essentially e-line, e-access type services um, um, in a way very similar to how you would do the previous 90. So is this mainly because of LEO technology, or is it both both mid and also high orbit technologies? I know it, it relates to all three um, orbit ah, classes, three. Uh, GEO, MEO, and LEO. Um, certainly, okay. Leos uh, have been getting a lot of uh, a lot of the uh, you know the um, the uh, the visibility as of late, um, largely because of companies like uh, like SpaceX and Starlink. Um, however, I, I would tell you it uh, is equally as valuable to companies like SES that do uh, middle Earth orbit satellites, um, and companies like Intelsat that do uh, geo based satellites. Got it. Now let's talk about. This connectivity. So carry Ethernet, you talked about, very typical. It's a layer two technology. What about internet? Like, you know, IP internet service is massive, and now SD-WAN on top, you talked about that. Yep. And that's, that's standardized not only all of these technologies, but also the automation aspects of this. How does this all relate um, to the satellite industry? And can can they deliver all of these? Can they deliver Ethernet, carry Ethernet, internet? 
and so on at SD WAN, um, just like they get from regular wired or wireless technology like 5G. Um, same idea? Yeah, absolutely the same idea. And, and I would tell you it's the same benefit, right? When we talk about digital transformation. Um, today, uh, m- most satellite operators already deliver um, IP services and SD WAN um, on a regular basis. Um, the, the problem is, again, um, typically um, it requires um, very manual um, service provisioning and troubleshooting. Um, and typically it's a limited set um, of features that are available. And it's because historically um, the network infrastructure that's been used for the satellite operators is proprietary in nature. As I mentioned earlier, it's been modified um, to really provide um, ideal um, bandwidth efficiency. Um, not, now that the bandwidth um, has increased dramatically, um, we finally have this opportunity where um, we can make bandwidth efficiency a little bit less of a factor and focus much more on standards. Um, and when we do that, right, we start with things like carrier Ethernet, right? It's the baseline plumbing of the world as we know it. Um, but it allows us then to e- really extend that same methodology for standard services um, up the stack um, and, and deal with things like, uh, you know, like IP-based services and, uh, and SD-WAN. Sure. And, you know, I've been reading a lot of articles about how satellites are using for 5G. So, you know, 5G has low band, mid band and high band spectrum. So basically you're saying that a satellite operator could beam out 5G to my cell phone? Ha. Yeah, it's ab- absolutely. So, so, so 5G is an interesting topic, Pascal. There's, there's actually two ways that we could talk about it in terms of standards. Um, the easiest is, uh, you know, historically satellites been typically used for something called satellite or a cellular backhaul. Um, so you would have an E node B or a G node B um, at a remote location providing wireless connectivity, um, and its connection to its associated core. Uh, would be done over a satellite channel. Um, you know, what happens nowadays, especially with 5G, um, that G node B has been virtualized um, and it allows it to be um, much more distributed. So components of the G node B, um, the centralized unit, for example, the CU can be located um, in a satellite gateway. Um, and really the only infrastructure that's out at the tower might be the DU, the distributed unit, um, and the RU. So, um, you know, if you wanted to try to do that over today's satellite links, it would be difficult because the link between the CU and the DU that goes over satellite, um, actually, again, it's proprietary. Um, it doesn't follow even basic principles like carrier Ethernet. Um, as we move to more standards-based services um, over the satellite link, it allows you to, to be much more mainstream about the way that you do satellite backhaul um, for 5G. Um, it allows you to kind of distribute the elements of the G node B that are critical um, to the tower. Um, and then other elements you can run in centralized fashion, maybe closer to the core. Um, so, so just in, in the basic fundamentals of cellular backhaul, I, I would tell you it absolutely applies. Um, as we look forward, um, there's a lot of exciting things going on right now in the industry around something called 5G NTN, um, non-terrestrial networks. Um, and that's really taking the next step where you put the equivalent of the G node B or the base station um, in the satellite gateway. Um, and uh, you actually use um, 5G and R as a waveform um, to deliver uh, um, 5G connectivity over the satellite itself. Um, and that's being done uh, today at a very basic level, um, typically referred to as a direct to device. In most of those cases, it's pre-standard um, 5G NTN but there's a huge movement in our industry over the next couple of years to migrate um, those directed device deployments around a common standard like 5G NTN, but also to uh, to build it out um, to a broader base of services that are more like uh, you know broadband. So what what is 5G NTN for uh, so, our listeners? So 5G NTN, it, um, the NTN stands for non-terrestrial networks, um, and really what it is is it's an adapt of the 5G standards that roll out of a 3GPP um, to allow that, um, that waveform um, and those common data control and management channels um, to be uh, retrofitted to run on satellite. Um, so so a, a really good example of a change that has to happen um, is the way that you accommodate latency. 
Um, so if, if you look at 5G standards today, if you tried to uh, separate a, a G node B from its core, there's very distinct latency requirements um, that you have to follow um, just for the network itself to have its heartbeat and for user equipment to be able to pair with an associated G node B. Um, as, as you go to um, NTN, what's happened is the standards have been modified to allow the, the user equipment, the UEs or the handsets to actually have a much longer latency profile between um, themselves and the serving base station or the G note B. Um, there's many other things that are being adapted as well, but I think latency is the one that gets talked about the most. Well, that that is really an interesting use case. That That is actually, I think what 5G has really done is done some really major things by, by allowing more spectrum, low, mid, mid, and high band. But I think it also it is also de- decouple the, like you said, the RUCUDU concept of the base station. And I think that's really powerful. So, you know, we're seeing 6G now coming and talking about, of course, years away from rolling out. So interesting how all of this will play together. Really, really exciting time for the satellite industry to be playing part of this whole role of digital transformation. So with that, um, Greg, any last, last thoughts? And I'm really, really thankful for you being on this show. Yeah, no, I, I think it's been a great discussion, Pascal. And uh, again, I appreciate the opportunity to get on and uh, and speak briefly with you uh, and uh, and your users. And uh, we'll uh, certainly, I, I agree. I think we have a, a really bright opportunity uh, within the, the satellite industry over the next three to five years, uh, largely through this increase in bandwidth. Um, and it really, for the first time, I think creates uh, an opportunity for us to grow um, really as a bigger part of the broader communications industry. Yeah, and I also think that because you have global reach, now everybody can be connected in some way, right? I mean, even a consumer can be connected. And the prices are coming lower and lower, um, which gives it a great, great opportunity to be able to connect the world wherever you might be. And even some foreign areas that can be served now can be served through satellite. So I think satellite has a huge promise. I know the hyperscalers have been investing massively into satellite technologies you see Amazon, Microsoft announcing all the programs in space. So I think it's going to be a really interesting time in the future as we see the space lights up for connectivity and all the options, including edge compute and, you know, where will AIML live? You know, some of the neural networks, they might live on space stations and who knows. And uh, so it's kind of interesting to see how this plays out. So I'm very fascinated. Anyways, Greg, great conversation. Thank you for having uh, being on this um, podcast. And I look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you. Thanks for joining us for Executives at the Edge. Don't miss an episode. Subscribe today. Share online a review. Find all our episodes on your favorite podcast platform and at left.net.